All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. I've got six o'clock. Um, we've got a lot of information to share tonight, so I want to get into our presentation as quickly as we can. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us, and I want to welcome you to our statewide conservation reserve program webinar. Um, we're excited to have you all here. I am Kim Cole. I'm the Missouri Outreach Coordinator for Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever. Um, I'm going to moderate tonight's session, help move, help move, move us through everything. Um, we've got two presenters with us tonight. We have Courtney Nix and Wesley Hanks. They are two of our Farm Bill wildlife biologists. Um, like I said, they have a lot of great information to share tonight about CRP. I'm going to turn it over to them um, in just a moment to let them introduce themselves. But before I do, um, I have a few housekeeping things that I want to mention tonight um, as we start our webinar. So we will be recording the presentation. Um, we're going to make that available um, after the webinar. It's going to be on our Missouri Quail Forever YouTube page. Um, we're also going to email the link um, to that recording to everybody who registered for the webinar. So if you're watching tonight, um, look for a link uh, for the recording to come in your email in the next couple of days. We'll get that sent out to you. Um, and then I also want to let everybody know um, your microphones and your cameras don't work tonight since we're in a webinar setting. So you should just be able to see us and hear us as the presenters. Um, so you can just sit back and relax and enjoy the webinar as we share the CRP information. Um, and since your microphones are muted, if anyone has questions throughout the webinar, um, there is a Q&A feature. You can find a little box down at the bottom and you can see that Q&A image there on the screen. Um, if you could type any of your questions into that Q&A feature, um, we'll try to answer some of those questions as we go on the webinar. Um, and then we might answer some of those questions um, in a, kind of in a live discussion at the end after our presenters get done um, with sharing all of their information. Um, so like I said, if you've got questions, type those into that Q&A feature and we'll try to um, get those answered as, as quickly as we can tonight. Um, so now I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Wesley and Courtney. I'm going to let both of them introduce themselves um, before getting into their presentation. Uh, and I'll kick it over to Wesley Hanks first, and I'll let him introduce himself. Good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley Hanks. I'm the Farm Bill Wildlife Biologist for Franklin, Warren, and Washington counties. So covering the east central part of Missouri. And here a little later, I'll be talking to you about the uh, general CRP, but uh, Courtney will take it from here. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Nix. I am a farm bill wildlife biologist that works out of the Moberly office. I cover Randolph, Sheraton, and Macon counties. Um, we've got a, quite a bit to cover tonight, so I'm going to just jump right into our presentation. So today we will be introducing the Conservation Reserve Program, um, and we'll talk about the significance it plays in the world of conservation. We'll discuss some of the requirements for eligibility and enrollment, touch on soil rental rates across Missouri, and then jump into the differences between continuous CRP and general CRP. I will touch a few, on a few common continuous practices, and then Wesley uh, will discuss general um, CRP and the ranking process associated with it. Um, he will finish up with the establishment and management of acres enrolled in the program. And we will take questions at the end um, for as long as time allows. To start, there is a lot of confusion about whose program this really is. Um, there are so many agencies and organizations assisting with this program that it can be extremely confusing. Um, to shed light on that, this is how it's broken down. So first, we have the Farm Service Agency. Uh, that's FSA, who is the administer of the program under the United States Department of Agriculture. This is who will take, uh, or who you'll talk to about eligibility of your acres. They process the offers and uh, issue the payments accordingly. Then you have the National Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, uh, NRCS holds the technical responsibility, so they provide you with the conservation plan, the guides, um, you know, that guide guiding you through that establishment, establishment and maintenance of the habitat that you are actually conducting. Um, then you have the Missouri Department of Conservation and Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever who provide lift to NRCS as partner biologists. Um, helping to provide those techni technical services as well. 
Now, the thing to remember is that this is a very large program and has a lot of moving parts and requires an all hands on deck approach to implement. Uh, that leads me to uh, why we have this program in the first place and how does it benefit the participants? So as you travel through Missouri's landscape, I have no doubt that you have come across one of the most significant resource concerns, uh, soil loss. Easy to identify by the cuts and grooves that remain after topsoil has been washed away. Uh, this is the cost of farming highly erodible land. CRP was put in place in the mid 1980s to encourage farmers to take these highly erodible acres out of production and put them into perennial cover to protect valuable topsoil. Another significant cost of farming every acre is water quality degradation. The sediment and nutrients flow off these fields and straight into our rivers and streams. With the implementation of perennial grasses in select areas, there is an advantage of slowing this movement of water from the fields and offering better filtration, trapping the, these sediments and nutrients before it has a chance to exit the field. A concept somewhat more recent is targeting odd areas that are being farmed. These are acres that are a little bit harder to get into with farm equipment and it creates less efficiency. Uh, some CRP practices offer opportunities to square these fields off and eliminate point rows to become more efficient. So field, ed or field edges is um, another, like edge effect is another issue, which is experienced whenever you have tree shading, tree shading out your crops and pulling moisture from those plants. Uh, the production that falls off in these areas can be quite significant. As you can see, the first several rows of corn here from the edge do not produce as well as the other rows further from the edge. Often landowners will remove those trees to eliminate the problem, but that can sometimes lead to erosion concerns and can be quite costly. Instead, you could implement a conservation program along these edges, creating habitat, soil retention, and gain a return on each and every one of those acres. As we speak about profitability, I would be amiss if I didn't touch on precision agriculture. Uh, this is an emerging science, helping producers identify areas of high and low yield. Uh, by using GPS, annual yield data can be collected on a foot-by-foot -foot basis and allow producers to identify the productive areas from unproductive areas. Ultimately, we are seeing that in many cases, farmers have portions of the field that are very high yielding and others that are actually bringing down the average bushel per acre. Uh, using this technology allows for the farmer to then identify low yielding areas that are essentially losing money and apply conservation programs where it benefits the operation. In my opinion, there's no better slogan to capture this idea than farm the best, conserve the rest. And that brings us to our conservation reserve program. As you move through the, the CRP sign up process, you will likely be presented with several options. Uh, the first thing to understand is that there is a difference between continuous sign up and the general sign up. The continuous sign up does have a does not have a deadline and offers um, are accepted throughout the year. Uh, this does not require a ranking process and you must only meet a few criteria to be accepted. Uh, these are typically practices that enhance water quality, um, serving as filters or buffers along field edges. And there are a few exceptions that we will cover as well. Uh, the general signup has a a sign up window uh, this year being now until March 11th, you must submit an offer, which is then ranked, and then you will 
later be notified if the offer has actually been um, accepted or not. Um, we will touch on, on these more in a minute, but first let's look at submitting an offer. So in order to qualify for CRP, whether general or continuous, you must have owned or operated the land for the past 12 months. There are a few exceptions to that rule, such as if the land was already enrolled in CRP when you purchased it. Um, but those are the questions you could ask your FSA if you are un unsure of. Uh, the parcel you are offering must have been cropped four of six years from 2012 to 2017. This applies to cropland, obviously not currently enrolled in CRP, or land that is currently enrolled but expiring in 2022. Uh, many people want to know what dictates how much you will get paid annually. Uh, the soil rental rate is based on the relative productivity of the soils within each county and the average cash rent for that county. Uh, with that in mind, uh, a property in northeastern Missouri will have a much different value than a property in the Ozarks. Um, this, this year, you would expect to receive 85% of the county soil rental rate if you offered acres as a general contact, contract and 90% if of the county soil rental rate if you offered as a continuous contract. Um, this map here illustrates the rates at 85% of that county soil rental rate. Um, so you can take a look and see what dollar amount is being offered for your particular county. These rental rates and percentages change from sign up to sign up. So keep in mind though, once you, you actually enroll your acres, um, and it, it's that offer is it accepted, you are locked in for that payment for the life of the contract. A recent addition to the annual payment calculation are climate smart practice incentives. This offers additional money for certain practices when establishing components such as woody biomass, uh, grass and legumes, or just grass alone. In addition to your annual payment, you may also receive a one-time payment of 50% cost share. That covers the cost to establish the vegetation. There are a few exceptions here, but you will be able to discuss that with your FSA before making any commitments. Uh, with continuous CRP, you may be qualified to receive a SIP and PIP. These are one-time incentive payments that are given with new enrollments that meet specific criteria. Again, since many things contribute to the one-time payments and annual payments, it's best to visit your local office to hash out um, those specifics of your offer. So let's jump into continuous CRP. And then Wesley is going to take over and share the details of general. Uh, remember, continuous offers may be made any time and have no ranking process. Uh, these are primarily buffer or field edge practices and are non-competitive. Um, however, the practice must meet the suitability and feasibility determinations. All this means is that you must be planning a practice that meets the resource concern. For example, a 20 foot buffer may not be suitable for 100 acres of runoff. Uh, it makes certain that the practice you're imp implementing is practical. Um, this is an ongoing signup, great for unprofitable acres like those edge effects we discussed earlier, or even squaring up the fields to better fit your farm equipment. So here are some commonly used continuous practices. You have um, your filter or buffer practices such as CP21 filter strips, CP22 riparian buffers, we have 33s, uh, habitat buffers for upland birds, and um, 
a very cool practice, CP43 prairie strips, which is fairly new and we'll, we'll discuss here in a minute. Um, then there are CP23s that focus on wetland restoration, uh, 38 safe practices that aim to restore specific habitats, and then CP42s that offer unique pollinator habitat. I'll mention here that the contract terms vary with continuous CRP, and you can um, typically offer those acres um, for 10 or even 15 years. So let's look at, at a few of these a little closer. Filter strips. Um, this is a strip of vegetation that runs along streams, lakes, ponds, and wetlands. Uh, they're used to filter runoff before entering these areas. Filter strips can be uh, 20 to 120 foot wide, the size obviously being determined uh, by that suitability and feasibility determination that I mentioned earlier. We have wetland restorations. These acres uh, must meet a particular ratio of upland to wetland habitat to qualify for a floodplain or non-floodplain contract. Uh, CP23s must meet a hydric soil requirement and the vegetation to be established is then dependent on an ecological site description, which um, can even dictate whether it's tree plantings or grass planting. Habitat buffers such as CP33 um, is an established buffer composed of native warm season grasses and wildflowers. Um, this would be planted along the exterior edge of the field while the interior of the field would continue to be farmed and row cropped. Um, your crop field has to be five acres or greater to implement this practice. And um, you can, your border has to, or can be 30 feet to 120 feet with this practice as well. And you must create a 10th of an acre of woody cover for, for every 40 acres of evaluated cropland. So woody cover would include native shrub plantings, uh, edge feathering, or down tree structures. The CP42 is a wildflower heavy planting uh, that encourages incredible insect diversity, much like the CP33, offering a buffet of insects to turkey uh, poults and ch quail chicks. Um, these plantings can offer amazing canopy cover where they're broad leaves and, um, you know, they have that stemmy uh, profile. So the, beneath the leaf layer is fairly open ground and it can offer um, great cover for fawning and protection from aerial predators. Uh, the CP42 can be offered in the general signup or the continuous signup. Uh, Wesley will discuss how it can be used to enhance your general CRP score and um, has no acreage limit in general signup. But conversely, uh, as a continuous practice, it is eligible for SIP and PIP, but it has a limit of 10 acres per tract, not to exceed 10% of the cropland acres of the farm. Um, each CP42 plot must be at least half an acre as well. CP43 prairie strips is an exciting, relatively new practice. Uh, with this practice, you would be able to establish diverse perennial vegetation oriented linearly within row crop fields. Um, these strips reduce soil erosion, improve water quality, and provide quality quality wildlife habitat. Um, they can also be 30 to 120 foot strips, not to exceed 25% of the crop, cropland area per tract. Uh, the really cool thing about prairie strips is that they can actually be placed around the edges of fields, um, through the field and terrace channels, uh, next to waterways and pivot corners. And unlike the CP33, um, this practice does not require a woody component. 
I will lastly touch on the CP38 safe practices. Uh, these are wildlife focused specifically for quail and monarch habitat or sand prairie ecosystems. The Bob White Monarch Safe is available to landowners within the highlighted counties here. Uh, this focuses on establishing native grasses and forbs, as well as creating sh shrubby cover. The shrubby cover component must be 1% or a tenth of an acre, whichever is larger of the offered acres. Um, participants are required to plant at least one 30 by 50 area of native shrubs. The re remaining shrubby cover can come from edge feathering or by constructing down tree structures. The Missouri Sand Ecosystem Safe is meant to restore sand prairie, sand woodland, sand savannas, and associated wetland upland prairie complexes. Uh, this practice is available in spe specific watersheds within the listed counties here. Uh, if you fall within one of these counties and are interested in this particular practice, it's worth checking your eligibility with your local FSA. Um, please, please remember, uh, we realize there, there are a lot of details to each one of these programs, and um, this is really why we have um, technical assistance available to you to walk you through all of these things. Um, that pretty much sums up the continuous practices, and uh, now I will hand it over to Wesley to discuss general CRP. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, yeah, so I will start talking about about the general CRP sign up options. And again, general CRP is the one with the ongoing sign up currently that ends uh, March 11th. Uh, so we'll dive right in here. Uh, first off, just kind of the general information about general CRP. It is considered more of a whole field practices, uh, unlike the continuous, which is more your your field borders and buffers, as Courtney mentioned. Another difference is the uh, it is competitive to where uh, offers are ranked and they may be accepted, they may not be accepted. Um, again, they can be 10 to 15 year contracts and all continue all general CRP offers that are accepted, the contracts will begin October 1st of 2022, assuming they're accepted during this current sign up. Uh, the, the general uh, the, the eligibility requirements are the same as far as cropping history and land ownership, as, as Courtney mentioned, for, for continuous CRP, but there are some additional uh, eligibility requirements. Uh, one is that there, the roadability index for the, for the acres offered must be greater than eight, uh, so it has to be more of erosive soils, and that is something that FSA determines using the predominant soil types of the acre, of the, of the offer. Um, if it does not have the erodibility index or eight or greater, it, it can qualify if it's existing CRP and you're looking to re-enroll. Um, but it can also, uh, that map to the, to the right there, the priority areas, if it falls within one of those red areas in the state, it also qualifies for general CRP regardless of erodibility index. Uh, if you're outside of those red areas, you have to have that erodibility index of eight or greater to qualify for general CRP or be expiring CRP. Uh, the general CRP practices, these the, the two by far most common ones here in Missouri are CP1 and CP2. CP1 is the introduced grass species, so your, your fescue, your brome, uh, timothy orchard grass, that type of stuff. Uh, CP2 then is your native warm season grasses, so your big blue stem, Indian grass, little blue stem. Um, another real common practice is CP12 in a food plot. One thing to note about that is the CP12 is not a standalone practice. It can be used in conjunction with a CP1 or CP2 to add some enhancement for wildlife benefit, which we'll go into here in just a, in a couple of slides. Uh, and then you can see we have the CP42 again, which is a pollinator habitat that Courtney detailed for, uh, that's also available in continuous CRP. So now we'll dive into the whole rank, the, the ranking process, how they, applications are ranked by using the Environmental Benefits Index or EBI. Uh, 
offers are given a score using the EBI. That score is then sent up to the national FSA office and they determine a cutoff score. If offers, offers that fall below that cutoff score are rejected and offers that are above that cutoff score are accepted and can go into CRP contracts. There are a couple of these that can be controlled by the participant and how they offer and what they offer, but there's but uh, water quality benefits, erosion reduction benefits, and uh, air quality benefits cannot be impacted by the participant or the offer. Those are um, well, those are based on where you're at in the landscape, and then also the erodibility of the uh, predominant soil types of the offer. So they can't really be again they can't be controlled. Uh, the main ones that can be controlled or the ones that can be controlled by the participant are the N1 or the wildlife benefits, and then the N6, which is the cost. Um, the N1 wildlife benefit can be can influence enduring benefits and carbon sequestration, but uh, that's kind of a byproduct of the wildlife benefits, and we'll, we'll touch on that as well. So looking closer at the wildlife factor, the N1, there are, uh, there are three sub-factors underneath the, the wildlife factor and determine how beneficial that uh, the cover out there and the, the offer is to wildlife is basically what we're doing here. Um, so the N1A, this, this I know this is there's a lot going on on this uh, table here, uh, but this just highlights uh, what types and what existing stands or what uh, mixes being planned to be planted score what points. Um, the first thing you'll notice if you look at the CP1 and CP2 uh, blocks, if it's uh, if it's an existing CRP that's just a pure sand of fescue, pure sand of brome, pure sand of big blue stem or Indian grass, then it gets zero points because a monoculture of anything is very little use to to wildlife. And then when you as you get more diverse, you get more points uh, for your EBI. Uh, this is just a continuation of that table. Um, you can kind of see there from the, the C, if, you, if you do pollinator habitat, you automatically uh, get your max points for, for wildlife cover benefits there. Um, the takeaway of these two tables though, is the more diverse you get, the more natives you get, the higher, the, the more EBI points you get for wildlife cover. So that'll just increase your odds of getting an accepted offer for the general CRP signup. The next sub factor is wildlife enhancement. Uh, there are two ways to add some enhancement points to your to your CRP offer. The first is by adding food plots at CP12 that I talked about uh, to earn the five additional points for uh, for the, for your offer. You can do an annual permanent food plot up to ten percent of the uh, of the field, but not to exceed five acres per field. And the food plot has to be a minimum of a quarter of an acre to get those points. Uh, you can also add on top of that, on top of it, offer some pollinator habitat or the CP42. Uh, so if your offer is 10 acres or less, you have to offer at least one acre of that to be pollinator habitat to receive those points. If your offer is over 10 acres, then you have to offer 10 percent of that uh, of the of the of the prop of the ground to receive those 20 points for for the enhancement for pollinator habitat. And then the N1C is a wildlife priorities, priority zone. Uh, this you can kind of control, but at the same time, it, this does depend on where you are in landscape. Uh, referring back to that one map that I showed you with those red areas, uh, one, you have to be within one of those red areas on that map and also have a wildlife cover that uh, is 40 points or more to get the wildlife priority zone additional points. Uh, now the enduring benefits. That's, a, that's a, this is this is kind of a byproduct. This is, is a byproduct of your wildlife benefits and your wildlife cover. Uh, the way this is viewed is you get more points for practices that are deemed to be uh, more likely to continue after maybe the lifespan of that contract. So you'll be able to see that top line there. Tree practices receive the mo receive the most points because if it's established trees, it's less likely to be converted back to um, a crop to crop use. Uh, but then also CP42, pollinator habitat, you get you 25 points uh, for enduring benefits because if you're most likely, if you're going through the process of establishing uh, native pollinator habitat, uh, you're likely going to uh, keep it. Um, and then you'll notice there at the bottom, CP1, CP2, they get zero points for enduring benefits because those at the end of a contract, they could be easily converted back to crop use. 
And then the, the N6, um, if you have some acres that you just really want to get in general CRP uh, and you're willing to take an, a decrease on your annual rental rate, you can get certain percentage points off your, your annual payment and you can earn more points that way. And that table shows how the percentage that you've taken off your payment and the corresponding additional EBI points that you'd receive if you decide to take less money. So and kind of improving your EBI. Uh, well, this is kind of a really simple, quick example of how you can improve your EBI by the decisions you make uh, when you do your offer. So let's say you have 100 acres of introduced grasses, which is your CP1 that you want to re-enroll. So it wasn't CRP, but you want to try to get it back into CRP. Uh, the first scenario is you can just leave it as is. Just leave it in the cool season grasses that are there existing and not do any kind of enhancements or anything to do more uh, more wildlife friendly. Uh, scenario two, you the offer you submit is to convert it to a CP2 uh, 50 point mix. And then as part of that, you're also willing to do 10% of that into CP42 pollinator habitat. So looking at the comparison for the scores there for the scenario one, where you're just gonna let it be as is, your N1A or your wildlife cover is you only get 10 points there. Uh, nothing for N1B, which is your enhancement. Nothing for N4, which is the enduring benefits. Uh, you do get three extra points for the N5D, which we didn't really talk too in depth about, but that is a carbon sequestration uh, additional points. And for for just a, for cool season grasses or just grasses not real diverse, they, they give three points for that. So for scenario two, we've increased our N1A to 50 points because we're going to a 50-point CP2 mix. We've increased our uh, wildlife enhancement in B N1B to 20 points because we decided to do pollinator habitat. We've also increased our enduring benefits by uh, doing some pollinator habitat, giving us 25 points. And then diverse mixtures of grasses and wildflowers gives us more points for carbon sequestration. So there's a total of 100 points there. So that's a difference of 87 points. Uh, you've increased your offer just by just switching it up a little bit, trying something new, and getting to be more wildlife wildlife friendly. Now we'll kind of take a look at some of these uh, the, these practices and talk a little bit about some of the mixes. And you can see there's a table there that kind of outlines the, the potential EBI points that are along with these practices. Uh, so what we're looking at here is a 40 point uh, CP1 mix. So this is considered the most wildlife friendly cool season grass legume mixture. Um, and you can, we, we still have the opportunity to do wildlife improvements. So that's where you see food plots or, or, or CP42 there. And you can see the corresponding range uh, down there for, for the potential for CP1. And that mix that you're looking at there for the most wildlife friendly is a mix of uh, orchard grass, timothy, red top, annual espadiza, or alfalfa, or uh, a mix of uh, native forbs, which would be a mix of 20 different native forbs thrown in with, with those cool season grasses. Next, we're going to take a look at the CP2, which is a uh, native warm season grass, predominantly native warm season grasses uh, that you're planting. Uh, the most wildlife friendly is going to be at least three different species of native warm season grass with a mixture of uh, 20 or more native forbs. Uh, there you can see just by uh, being a, having natives, you get 50, you get 10 extra points over the, the most wildlife friendly cool season grass. So that's going to increase your EBI potential there. Uh, they're at the bottom there to get a get a higher range than was with the CP1. Uh, this next one, CP25, rare and declining habitat restoration. Uh, this practice is designed to kind of uh, recreate historic prairies. So this is most applicable in western and northern Missouri, where prairies and savannas would have historically existed within Missouri. Uh, the big benefit here is. With the CP25, there, there's some enduring benefits of extra EBI points there. And there's also more carbon sequestration points awarded there. So you got an even higher range than CP1 or CP2. Um, and for these mixes, we're looking for, we're, we're kind of trying to recreate existing or what historically existed there as far as the prairie plant communities. The last practice we'll talk in depth, we'll talk a little more about is CP42, which again is that pollinator habitat. 
And for general CRP, when you're uh, for pollen habitat, you could do a field of exclusively uh, native forbs, at least 20 different species, uh, if erosion really isn't too much of a concern there. But if you want to add some grasses, if you want some grasses in the mix, you can do it, uh, two or more native warm season grasses along with that 20 uh, species forb mix. And there you can see if, if, if you do, it's just a CP42 offer, you're pretty well right at that, that 100 points for EBI on, on the wildlife side of things. Now we're going to discuss cover management. Uh, the, the goal of cover management, and this used to be called mid-contract management, but they've, they've changed the name. And this is just maintaining the, the, the stand of grass or just whatever, whatever you've planted for CRP in a wildlife-friendly manner. Um, this management is required between years three and, three and six of the CRP contract. Um, and like I said, it's to maintain the wild, to maintain as wildlife friendly. It's also to keep it in what we term as farmable condition. Uh, that means if you were to take out a CRP today, you'd be able to continue farming it. And uh, this is where some folks can get into some trouble if they have too many woody sprouts out there. Uh, if, if trees are starting to take over it and it's not a tree practice that can be deemed as not in farmable condition. So that's kind of part of uh, the management and maintenance of CRP. And then also, uh, keeping invasives like cerise lespedeza thistles and stuff from taking over uh, part of it. That's also kind of part of the managing. Make sure that the cover that should be there stays there and is, is functioning appropriately. Uh, so we have some options when it comes to cover management. Uh, first, we want to talk about is disking. Uh, the goal of disking is to kind of is is to create bare ground and to create some space for uh, just some, some annuals and just some other forbs that are being suppressed by the by dense grasses to express themselves. Um, we're, for this practice, we don't wanna be disking more than one third of the field in a single year. So the first year you disc a third, second year you disc the next third, and then the third year you come back and, and disc the final third. And this creates some good structure, little diversity, and also allows for some different plant diversity as well. With this practice, we only want to be disking with the contour. We don't want to be disking up and down a slope to create uh, potential for new erosion. And then if invasive species are an issue on your property, uh, the, this bare ground can create kind of ideal growing conditions for uh, invasives to kind of take hold. So it may not be the best practice if you have substantial invasive species uh, issues. The next management practice we'll talk about is prescribed fire. Uh, this is one of the more cost-effective uh, management tools we have out there, and this can uh, clear thatch, create that bare ground, but it can also control some of those undesirables, such as uh, if you have fescue creeping into warm season grass and or, or woody sprouts. Like in this picture here, they had some cedars creeping in there, so they run a fire through it, cedars hate fire, those trees are no longer an issue. Uh, but when it comes to controlling undesirable vegetation, Timing is everything when we're, when we're doing prescribed burns. Um, prescribed burning, there are some limiting factors for folks to be able to do prescribed burning, such as uh, potentially expertise and, and just equipment in general. Uh, so Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever Missouri has partnered up with the Department of Conservation and the National Wild Turkey Federation to form uh, prescribed burn associations across the state. Um, these, are these are led by local landowners and essentially it's landowners helping landowners get burns done. Uh, to find out more about prescribed burn associations or just prescribed fire in general, uh, you can visit MissouriPrescribedFire.org. This website is uh, put together by the Missouri Prescribed Fire Council and is full of really great resources. Uh, if, you, if you're just getting started burning or if you've been burning for a while, just some additional information there. That's it's really, really good information. Uh, the, the third uh, management option we have is uh, using herbicides or chemical control. Uh, the, the purpose here is not to kill out the grass stand or whatever you have out there, uh, but it is, it's to kind of suppress those thick grasses, whether they're warm season or cool season, and create some space for that diversity to express itself. Um, this can be helpful if you do have those invasive species because you can use that maybe to, you can use it in tandem with suppressing the um, cover that needs to be suppressed. You can also use it to, to control some of the invasives that you have out there. Um, this is a good moment to mention that uh, mowing alone is not a, a standalone management practice, but it can be used in conjunction with this herbicide application and disking. 
Uh, prior to herbicide application, it can be important to kind of mow the stand to allow good herbicide to plant contact. And then prior to disking, it can be a good idea to mow where you're going to disk so your discus isn't riding over some dense thatch that might be there um, if you if you hadn't if you hadn't mowed it down, let it dry it a little bit. Um, and this chemical control, like I said earlier, like with disking, if you have invasive species, maybe that's not the best option. This would be another option because you're not creating that bare ground that will facilitate germination of new of new undesirable species. One of the newer management options we have is called impact grazing. Um, and this can be summarized by high stocking rates for uh, short durations. The intent of this impact grazing is to create some bare ground with, with the hoof action from the cattle and then just you know doing what cows do, eating that biomass up and, and just kind of just being there uh, this, to create that bare ground. Um, and by short duration, ideally the cow, the, the cattle are on you know one area for a day and then they're moved, but they can be up on the same acres for 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 two days. But two days is a max that they can be on on one area. Um, the timing of impact grazing is determined by the species of grass that you have out there, whether CP1 or CP2. Um, and the big thing here is the landowner, as landowner, you must have. Uh, enough cattle and the appropriate infrastructure to facilitate this. And uh, the, the same acres cannot be grazed two years in a row. So there has to be a full year break between, between grazing events. Um, uh, this, this last one we're going to touch on the interseeding. It is not a management practice on its own, but it can be used following a management practice uh, to, to add some wildlife benefit out there. So to, maybe you want to overseed some alfalfa or maybe some nat nat native forbs or something into an existing grass stand. So you suppress that vegetation by either disking, burning, uh, applying herbicide or using your cattle. And then you can go out there and seed additional grass species or additional wildflower or, or forb species. Um, and overall, good CRP management is good farm management. There's no real, there's no wildlife cover out there, especially if you're looking to benefit wildlife. There's no wildlife cover out there that you can just establish and then walk away without any management. It takes some sort of management using the tools I just explained um, to, to maintain it as a wild in a wildlife friendly manner. Um, one thing when we're planning these management activities, though, uh, we have to avoid the primary nesting season, which runs from May 1st to July 15th. This is when grassland birds like bobwhite quail are having nest and raising young out there. Uh, so we can't be disturbing those field, fields during that time. The exceptions would be if you do have invasive species like Cerisi lespedeza, thistles, teasels, Johnson grass, the best time to treat those is during that primary nesting season. Um, so you can go out there and spot treat them, but if there's some more extensive, if, if, if it's gotten really bad and broadcast applica herbicide application is needed or something like that, then you do need to talk to the FSA office before you do um, any kind of full field kind of treatment. Uh, FSA will then in turn reach out to NRCS, MDC, or a QF biologist to kind of get a written justification on why that practice is needed during that time. So it is possible but just be sure to talk to your FSA office before you apply anything to the, on, a, on a broad scale in that field. As a reminder, the uh, general CRP signup ends March 11th. The continuous CRP signup is ongoing through, uh, through August. Like Courtney and myself, there are se there are several uh, other farm bill biologists scattered across the state. Uh, all the counties sh shaded in color are covered by a, a farm bill biologist that can help with all your CRP technical CRP needs. Um, if you can, if you scan that QR code, it'll take you to our uh, Missouri Quill Forever website, and you'll see all the contact information for all the biologists that we have across the state that can help you out on CRP. Uh, we do have, if you're interested in a wetland CRP practice, we do have three new wetlands biologists kind of on, on the map there. You'll see those uh, those green ducks kind of scattered in a line going from the northwest down to the southeast there. You'll see th those those green ducks there. They're, they'll be pretty helpful when it comes to thinking about wetlands. Um, you can also follow Quail Forever in, in Missouri on the various social media platforms. Um, and you can visit that Missouri PFQF.org to see all the to see all the events we have in the state of Missouri and just get updates 
from, you know, what we've got going on from Habitat Tours to workshops like this. Um, so I want to thank you all for listening. And I believe Kim's going to take it from here. Yes, I'll take it back over from you, Wesley. Um, thank you and thank Courtney as well um, for the awesome presentation and for all the really great information about CRP. Um, I know we've had a lot of questions come in, so um, I think we're just going to jump right into those questions. Um, there were several of you that submitted questions ahead of time with your registration as well. Um, so thanks for sending us all those really awesome questions. Um, the first one, I'm going to kick over to Courtney. So Courtney, the first question um, that we had, this one came in in the chat, um, it was sent in ahead of time as well, is prescribed fire encouraged on CRP sites or are those sites better left undisturbed? Um, I would say yes, it's very encouraged. Um, prescribed fire is great for early successional uh, development along with uh, removing that that heavy thatch and residue from your fields. And so as Wesley mentioned, it can be um, you know, utilized to target uh, cedar, cedar encroachment. Um, the one thing you do need to um, keep in mind is if you do have something like Cerecia in your fields, you would want to um, probably follow up with some type of herbicide uh, control as well, because when you are putting fire on the ground, you are stimulating that regrowth and it can cause some flare up with your invasive species. So coming through there and following up with an herbicide treatment is really important. And if you are somebody that's you know, unfamiliar with fire or uncomfortable with it, you know, talk to your, your local planner there and um, get some advice on, you know, timing and how to, how to maybe conduct that. You know, they can probably hook you up with some of our partner resources. NBC has, um, you know, prescribed fire uh, trainings available for landowners, and um, that would be a really good route to go. And, um, if you don't know who that is, you know, contact us and we can get you in touch with the right people. Excellent. Thanks, Courtney. That was a, a great answer for that one and um, lots of good information about why, how fire is beneficial for CRP and how we can get folks um, signed up or connected with some of those professionals. Um, another one um, that came in. Wesley, I'm going <clears> to <throat> kick this one over to you. Um, so the question was, if you recently bought a farm that has acreage in CRP, what should you do to give yourself the best chances for re-enrollment? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think kind of the first step there would be to reach out to the FSA office and see what CRP practice that, that prop, those acres are enrolled in. Uh, to see, because that'll determine what your obligations are for, for maintaining as is. Um, you're more likely to be able to get a, a re-enrollment if you're doing everything you need to be doing to maintain the existing CRP as the cover that, as the, the cover that it's in. Because uh, if you know what it's supposed to be in, then you can potentially do some enhancements if it's not quite there where it needs to be, you know, before it, before that time comes. So just basically step one, know what it should be from the FSA can, can help you with that. Excellent. Thank you. All right. The next one, um, Courtney, I'll kick this one over to you. Are there specific seed mixes required for each practice? Sure. So yeah, we have a lot of um, different seed requirements depending on the practice that you do. I know uh, Wesley touched on a few um, components of some of the general practices. For example, if you were to go into a CP2 general um, contract, you would have a couple seed mixes to choose from, but those are um, set pure live seed per square foot um, mixes. And um, even though you have a few options there, they are, they are very tied to how much form component is in, um, incorporated and things like that. So, um, you know, definitely go in with the mindset of, you know, these are programs that have seed mixes that adhere to that, you know, that wildlife goal or that erosion, um, you know, concern. And so these mixes are, have been designed to help, um, you know, reach those goals and, and make things um, better and very successful for you as well. 
right, excellent. Thank you. We've had a couple more come in. Um, I'll put this one out there for either one of you. Um, this one came in, uh, it says, I don't understand the four of six through 2012 to 2017 requirement. What does that mean? Or could, could you explain that a little, a little further? Yeah, so I, um, with the requirement that is essentially meaning between those particular dates, um, your property or that field, let's say, that you want to enroll had to be farmed for four of six years. Um, that could be alternate, alternating from crop to um, hay ground, um, as long as you were reporting a, a crop being taken off those acres, um, that's what is capturing that crop history. And so, you know, because the CRP program is directed towards, you know, your croppable acres, you know, those acres being cropped and putting them into something that is going to help with erosion concerns or things like that, um, that ground is essentially needing to be croppable to then enroll it into a program. And so if you have questions of, well, I don't know if I was capturing um, cropping, uh, like cropping history on certain acres, you can go to your local FSA and they will have those records for you, um, you know, to determine if you qualify or if you don't qualify. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's see, we've got a couple others here. Um, this is one that was sent in ahead of time. I have an 80 acre CRP field that has a good stand of native grass, but the Ceresia has crept in and taken over. What can I do? Um, so any recommendations for maybe some ways to try to help deal with some, just deal with some Ceresia on that land? Yeah, I can kind of help with that. But yes, I, I mean that's a that's a pretty common problem. So you see, kind of taking over over fields. I think step one would be to kind of reach out to your FSA office and NRCS office and just your local your local technical experts to kind of come up with a game plan to to maybe treat that because depending on on what cover it's in. If it's a pure stand of native grass and, and just some Sharicea mixed in and it's it's not supposed to have any wildflowers for your program, then there are ways to absolutely treat that. There are herbicides that are are broadly selective and won't hurt your grass stand. Um, now, if it's in a stand that has some existing diversity and that diversity needs to be maintained as far as additional wildflowers, then that can be kind of more of a targeted uh, targeted approach because uh, broadleaf herbicides that target Cerise Lespedeza will also harm and kill a lot of our desired native wildflowers. Um, so just kind of reach out to your local resource professionals and coming up with a plan of attack that way. Um, there are ways to do whether that's spot treatment with in diverse stands, or maybe you have to do a broadcast application if it's in a low diversity stand and you're just trying to kill the Cerise out of, out of some native grasses. Thank you. Let's see. Let me find another one here. Um, Courtney, I'll kick this one over to you. How does CRP support pollinators? Um, if you could share a couple of examples of um, different practices or just ways in general that CRP can help help benefit pollinators. Sure. So we have several different practices um, like CP42 that I discussed um, in the uh, continuous section, but also applies to the general signup. Um, that is a pollinator planting. And what that incorporates is, you know, a huge diversity of um, wildflower species. And so you're, you're having, you know, a variety of maybe 20 species, and that is the major components of that seeding. And, um, you know, whenever you're incorporating native plants to your seedings, you are inadvertently helping native insects. And so you're bringing in a ton of different um, opportunities for foraging for insects. And then coupled with that is also the advantage that our other species, you know, such as quail, you know, thriving off of that diversity of insects that they then can forage on as chicks and, and have that protein 
um, resource when they need it. Thank you. All right, let's see. We'll do, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this is one that came up a few times last year when we hosted our CRP webinar. Um, and it came up a few times in the questions that were submitted ahead of time for tonight. Um, a couple different ways it was asked, but is there a minimum acreage to apply? Um, or another another one we got, are there minimum or maximum acreages for CRP? Um, so if, if one of you or both of you could speak to that question too, we seem to get that one a lot. Is there a minimum acreage that folks need to be able to enroll? There is no real minimum acreage that uh, folks can enroll. With some of the practices, there are the maximum acreages, like Courtney touched on with continuous CRP and 42, CP42. There are some, there are some maximums there, but for the most part, um, it's it's pretty open as far as the, the 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 range of acres that can be offered. Excellent, thank you, Wesley. And then um, I think we'll do one more question real quick. This is one um, that came in to the Q&A and it was um, one of our other biologists who's helping out kind of behind the scenes answered the question, um, but it's one I'll go ahead and share. What are the recommended herbicides to use for treating a field prior to planting for pollinators? Um, so we get that question a lot, just of recommended herbicides or how to how to treat that. Um, the answer that we, that we provided for that one is glyphosate or a broad spectrum herbicide is the most common. Before a pollinator planting, we recommend at least two applications before seeding to control existing vegetation, um, especially if you're dealing with fescue or brome. And then um, we just recommend a local farm bill biologist or a private land conservationist um, through MDC. They can help you work um, on specifics with your property. So um, our staff can come out and, and look at your land and help you with some of those specifics to help with some of that, um, the management of that as well. So I don't see, let's see if we had any other questions that came in. Let's see, we had one. Um, I'll give you guys one more real quick since we have just a couple minutes. Does uh, prescribed fire for management require a written appro approved burn plan prior to burning? So if they're gonna do some burning on their CRP, um, what will they kind of need to do to prepare for that? Uh, I'll take that one. Yeah, so we have um, we have technical service providers that will write you a burn plan for those particular acres, and basically that is designed to make sure that you're, you know, you're meeting your goals appropriately. You know, we're we're targeting those acres and putting fire on the ground when it, it's appropriate if we're trying to manage, you know, the. Uh, cool season grass encroachment and native warm season stands or, um, you know, trying to enhance the warm season grass component, like all of that, like Wesley had mentioned earlier, timing is everything. And so if you're working with a planner and that you can get that burn plan, not only is it, um, you know, helping you, you know, guide you through that management process, but it's also giving you the parameters to conduct safe fire and, um, you know, the, having the right tools and showing you those right, um, the right ignition lines and things, you know, to do to, to prep and conduct that, that fire. Thank you. I think we're at just about seven o'clock. So I think that's all the time we'll have um, for questions tonight. I know many of you sent questions in um, and if we didn't get a chance to get yours in the Q and A tonight, um, or if you even have questions that come up after this, um, feel free to reach out to us. So you'll have my email address. I'm going to um, send out the recording to the webinar. Um, and then I shared in the chat a couple times the link to our website where you can find our staff information. Um, so feel free to reach out to me or any of um, the biologists in your area. If you've got questions, uh, we'll do our best to get those answered for you. Um, but I think just for the sake of time, we'll wrap up for tonight. Um, so I want to thank everybody for all of their questions. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Um, and thanks to our biologists as well, Wesley Hanks and Courtney Nix, for presenting tonight on CRP, sharing lots of good information. Um, again, you can reach out to any of our staff. Um, there's also private land conservationists through MDC that can pro provide assistance to you. Um, and you can reach out to your local USDA service center or FSA office. Um, and they can provide more information about CRP. 
ERP and getting your acres enrolled as well. Um, I do wanna give a big shout out tonight um, to our partners at over at the Missouri Department of Conservation um, and at the USDA as well. Um, that includes the FSA and then the NRCS. Um, we've got a lot of partners over there and they helped us um, as we got ready for this webinar and helped us spread the word. Um, so thank you for your support of our webinar tonight. Um, and again, thanks to everyone else for joining us. Um, we hope we provided you with some good information on CRP tonight. Um, as a reminder, we will share a recording of our webinar that'll be on our Missouri Quail Forever YouTube page, um, and I'll email a link to that recording out to everyone who was registered for the webinar as well. Um, so you'll have that information. Look for that coming soon in the next day or so. Um, Again, you can visit our website, MissouriPFQF.org. There's lots of great information um, there. And follow us on social media. You can find us. Um, our handle is at MissouriQF. Um, and that is all we've got for everybody tonight. So thanks again for joining us and reach out with questions. And please have a good night. Thank you.